Okay, so the next topic is a periodic table. This is in Chapter 6. Now, Mendeleev arranged his periodic table based on atomic mass at first. And then people started looking at that and realizing that there were some uh, discrepancies. It didn't always go up by atomic mass if you arranged them based on their properties. So the table was rearranged once they learned about the protons by the atomic number, which is equal to number of protons. Now, Mendeleev, obviously he organized the elements uh, that are known at the time in a useful manner, and he was able to predict the properties of undiscovered elements, and this was huge. And basically what he did is he looked at the elements above it and below it, where he believed that this element would, would be found eventually, and uh, he looked at their properties, or onto the left and to the right, and he kind of averaged or took the average of those properties, and he was able to make a prediction. What we currently know now about the periodic table is that all the metals are found on the left side of that zigzag line, and all the non-metals are on the right. And if you're in between, if you're on the zigzag line, unless you are uh, aluminum, you're going to be what we call metalloids. These guys touch the zigzag line except aluminum. except aluminum. So these are metalloids. Another name for metalloids are semi-metals, since they have some of the properties of metals, some of the properties of non-metals. All right. Now it says complete the following table with names, uh, electron configuration ending in number of valence electrons. You should be able to look in your peer, or look in your notes rather, for these names. Basically, you have to memorize alkali and alkaline earth metals, group one and two. And then these guys are easy. Whatever's at the top of the col or the group there, that's the name of the group, so boron, carbon group, nitrogen group, oxygen. And then you got to memorize halogens, and hopefully by now you know noble gases. So you need to know the names of them. You should know group 1 and 2 are the S block. Group 1 finishes in S1, group 2 finishes in S2. And then we enter the P block, so these guys are all going to have P's last. S has to be filled first in order to fill P's, so it's going to be S2, P1, S2, P2, you get the idea. All the way down here to group 8, where it's S2, P6. Helium's a little exception. It's in group 8, but it only has S2, because it only has two valence electrons, or two total electrons, I should say. Valence electrons, they go right in order. If we have groups going in order from 1 through 8, if they're numbered 1 through 18, then 1 and 2 will still be the same. But then on the P block, we'll start with 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Remember, we have other numbering systems. If you ever come across an element, for instance, in group 17, just ignore the 10 spot, ignore the 1, and just imagine 7, because that's going to tell you that it's S2P5 and it has 7 valence electrons. Okay? So you should be able to cheat and look at the periodic table and figure out how many valence electrons it has. Now, elements in the D block are referred to as transition metals. Um, the F are actually inner transition, because uh, they belong in there with the transition metals, but it would make the periodic table too wide, so we pull them down and it scrunches up the periodic table a little bit for us. The S and the P guys, they represent the rules. They follow the rules. Whatever period you're in, that's the coefficient. So if you're in period 4, it's 4S or 4P. If you're dealing with the D block and you're in period 4 of the periodic table, then it's going to be 3D. It's always one behind. And if you're dealing with the Fs, uh, they wouldn't show up till the 5th. But if you're in group, uh, for instance, 7, then the F are going to be 5F. It's always going to be 2 behind. Okay? So S's and P's represent the rules. They make life easy. They're called representative elements. Everybody else kind of does some weird things that we have to learn or kind of just memorize. Number six, which group of elements on the periodic table is most unreactive on the periodic table? Well, that's your noble gases. The reason they're unreactive is because they have a full outermost configuration. So here's helium. Helium only has two electrons. The first energy level, 1s, is filled. So it's nice and happy with 1s2. Then we get to neon. Neon's got 10 valence electrons. It's going to have two in the first energy level. 1s2 is filled. And then it's going to have eight here. So it's going to have 2s2 and 2p6. Everything is filled, and it's happy. Argon's got 18. It's got the 1s2 filled. Then the 2s2 and the 2p6 are filled. And then we move into the third energy level. 3s2, 3p6 are filled. So that all adds up to 18, and this is complete. It's nice and happy. So these guys are kind of the stuck-up elements. They don't deal with any other element on the periodic table. 
uh, they do their own thing because they don't need any more electrons or need to get rid of any electrons. All right, now let's talk about trends here. This says what's meant by the term shielding effect, and then uh, you have to actually put into practice which atom would have a greater shielding effect, lithium or cesium. Now, the shielding effect itself is kind of the interference or the electrons in the way between the outermost valence electrons and the nucleus. So the nucleus doesn't do as great of a job pulling on those valence electrons if there's a lot of electrons in the way. Plus, the electrons are negative. They don't like each other, so they're repelling each other. So they're pushing each other away from the nucleus. So if we take a look at group 1 elements, which is where our two examples are, lithium is right here up at the top, or near the top, and here's cesium near the bottom. Lithium looks like this. Lithium doesn't have a lot of valence electrons, or it doesn't have a lot of energy levels, I should say. It's got three total electrons. It's got the 1s2, and then it's got 2s1. That's all it's got. But then you look at cesium. Cesium's way down here. This is in, don't forget, hydrogen's up here. Group 1, 2, 3, 4, or period. Period 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So this is going to be 6s2, plus everything below it is filled. So when we look at uh, the amount of shielding that goes on over here, there's not much. There's not a lot of electrons in the way. That nucleus does a great job pulling on that one valence electron. Over here, there's a ton of electrons in the way. There's actually 54 electrons, the grand total 56. There's 54 electrons between the nucleus and these two electrons out here, these two valence electrons, out here in the 6th energy level. So this has a much greater shielding effect than lithium would have. So further down, you got a greater shielding effect, more electrons in the way. It's like kids sitting in the back of the classroom. It's harder for the teacher to see them because there's so many kids in the way. You're sitting in the first two rows. Teacher is really going to be able to see you and pay attention to what you're doing. All right, explain what happens with the following trends as you move uh, across the period and down a group. So we're going to be looking at it both ways. Let me see. Get this thing out of the way. Okay, across the period. So we're going to be going across. What happens to the size? Well, it gets smaller. And the reason it gets smaller is the nucleus gets stronger. Now, yeah, the nucleus does increase in size, but if, I, if I'm looking at Giant Stadium here, here's all of Giant Stadium, and here on the 50-yard line is a little tiny marble. If you change that marble to a golf ball, or even if you change it to a basketball, would that have an effect on the overall size of the stadium? And the answer is no. So same thing. If we change the size of the nucleus and make it a little tiny bit bigger by adding another proton, it's not going to change the size of the energy levels. So it's not the fact that the more protons make the nucleus bigger. That doesn't affect it. In fact, more protons makes the nucleus stronger, and it pulls these guys in stronger. So it's actually going to end up smaller. So as you go to the right and you have more protons, the atom gets smaller because it gets pulled in tighter. As you go down a group, this is kind of easy, it's self-explanatory. As you go down a group, you have more and more energy levels. So up at the top, you have very few energy levels. As you get closer to the bottom, there's a lot more energy levels, and more energy levels will obviously take up more space, so these guys are bigger. So understand the trends when you go across and when you go down in terms of size. And ionization energy. Ionization energy is how much energy we need to steal an electron. So if you look at this little picture here, if we want to take this electron away from this atom, how much energy do we need to pull it away from this positively charged nucleus? Now, if this nucleus is super strong, if this electron is super close, then it's hard to do, and we need a lot of energy. But if this uh, nucleus isn't very strong, for instance, if we're on this side of the periodic table versus on the right side, th this side of the period uh, have weaker nuclei than this side of the period, of the same period. Um, and if you're up at the top, you're going to be closer to the nucleus, so it's going to be a stronger pull. If you're near the bottom, it's going to be easier to steal an electron because they're further away from the nuclear pull. They're further away from the nucleus, so it takes less energy. So as you go across, more protons, the pull gets stronger. It's harder, so you need a higher ionization energy to steal an electron. If you go down a group, it gets easier. It decreases. You don't need as much energy. It's like somebody coming in and stealing a kid from the back of the classroom. It's not that hard to do because they're so far away from the teacher. There's a lot of that shielding going on. So the further you are away, the further you are from the positive pull, and the less energy you need to steal an electron away from that. Now, electronegativity, we're going to use this a lot in the next chapter. 
Electronegativity is the tug of war. How well do you do in a tug of war for shared electrons? So we haven't gotten a covalent bonding yet, but when we get to covalent bonding and we focus on electrons that are in between or traveling back and forth between, let's say, maybe a, a carbon and an oxygen, if they're going back and forth between carbon and oxygen, do they spend 50% of their time here and 50% of their time here? Or is it a 60-40? Is it a 30-70? What, what kind of uh, relationship is it? Or does one of them just grab the electron and run with it and just keep it forever and ever? So we can look at a table and see how well electrons or atoms will do when they're sharing electrons. These guys, these are like the big bullies of the periodic table. They take electrons and they hang on to them and they do awesome in tug of wars because they're up high in the periodic table, meaning they don't have a lot of energy levels in the way from the shared electrons. The electrons that they're sharing are pretty close to the nuclei, so this, the pull is strong. Plus, they're on the right side of the periodic table, and as you go across to the right in the same period, the strength of the nuclear pull gets stronger. So these guys are really, really strong. These guys are always going to lose. They're not very good at all. The electrons that they'd be pulling on are so far away, there's so many energy levels in between, that the nucleus doesn't have much of an effect on it, and they're on the left side of the period, so their nucleus isn't as strong because it doesn't have as many protons as something on the right side of the periodic table would. So these guys are terrible competitors. They don't do very well, and they have very low EN values. We're going to use this a lot when it comes time to figuring out uh, the polarity of bonds and whether or not it's a uh, one side of the molecule ends up keeping the electrons more than the other and ends up with a kind of a partial negative charge because the electrons hang out there more than the other side, which is going to be a partial positive charge. But that's to come. All right, what happens to the size when the following atoms become ions? You have to understand what happens with ions. First of all, cations are going to be positive. Remember that T in the middle is just like the T in the middle of the word metal, and it makes you think of a plus sign, as opposed to anions, which are negative nonmetals. So what happens to form a cation? Well, these guys are going to lose electrons. They have one, two, or three electrons they want to get rid of. So if you kick out an electron, you're basically kicking out an entire energy level. So like lithium will kick out one and it becomes much smaller because instead of having 1s2 and 2s1, it now only has 1s2. It only has the first energy level occupied. Here's sodium. Sodium normally has 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. It kicks out this 3s1 and now the third energy level is gone. It just has two energy levels, so it's smaller and so forth. Um, these guys down here, fluorine and chlorine, these guys do the opposite. They gain electrons. Fluorine is sitting there at 1s2, 2s2, 2p, oops, 2p5, and it just needs one more electron. Now, we're not changing the nucleus, so the nuclear pull isn't changing at all, but we're sticking another electron in there along with five other valence electrons that don't like each other. So instead of them staying this close to each other, now they're going to say, there's one more of us, we're going to repel each other even more, let's spread out and try to get even further away so that they end up getting a little bit bigger. So you'll see the fluorine changing in size and the chlorine changing in size. Okay. All right, so know your trends. Uh, it's helpful if you reread through the textbook or reread through your notes for this section, uh, but you should come in being able to elaborate and discuss all the different trends.